Okay, so good morning to our speakers and distinguished guests from the government, the diplomatic community, the academe, and think tanks. So happy new year, everyone. Hope you all had a wonderful celebration or a wonderful holiday season with your family and friends. And I hope you're all energized and ready for the new year. Although it's a bit gloomy outside, but I think we're serving coffee, so we'll be able to power through this morning. Uh, I am Joyce Ilas, and I will be your host and moderator for today. Welcome to the forum on prioritizing the national interest in Philippine foreign policy, strengthening alliances and strategic partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. So this event is organized by the Strat-Base Al Albert Del Rosario Institute in partnership with the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines. This is a hybrid event, and we would like to thank everyone who is here with us in our event venue today. And thank you as well to everyone who is joining us via Zoom and uh, Facebook live stream. So hosting a complex security environment coupled with its geopolitical importance, the Indo-Pacific has become a priority for various states. This is exemplified in the publication of their respective Indo-Pacific strategies as part of their foreign policy, which outlines their concerns in managing the security threats in the region. Here in the Philippines, President Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr.'s in-person meetings and foreign travels signify his administration's commitment to maximizing the country's existing partnerships and expanding its diplomatic networks. He also started the new year with a visit to China. He's there right now from January 3 to 5. So as the majority president, we all know with over 31 million votes, President Marcos Jr. is expected to implement strategies that prioritize and adhere to the interests of his constituents. This includes building a more responsive and strategic foreign and security policy for the Philippines based on the national interest, based on the national interest as its main driver and a primordial guide. So to open today's discussion, may we call on the president of a Strat-based ADR Institute. He will be sharing with us today the Institute's analysis on Philippine foreign policy. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Victor Andres Dindo Manhit. Thank you, Joyce. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome our participants, our guests, and of course, our speakers and resource persons, uh, which will be introduced uh, later. I think to our participants in Zoom, I think 164. Uh, I have, uh, have not only registered because we had over 220 registrations, but uh, hopefully they can all join. But now we have 164 of them, so welcome also. And to media, our friends in media, friends in the from the diplomatic community and civil society. For the past uh, decade, Stratbase, uh, ADR Institute, have tried to track movements of what we call the geopolitical <coughs> landscape in the Indo-Pacific. And we don't only look at it from the lens of traditional, but even non-traditional and evolving security threats. And part of that discussion is we, we try to track uh, issues as we, and as we track issues, we, we track how global issues at times shape our concerns. No? So allow me to maybe in a minute or two uh, ask my colleague to share some of the slides no? that I, we have prepared. Is there There's none? If not, I'll just continue. No? Uh, something that we, we do in Strat-based ADR Institute is come up with analysis. And our analysis will always be based on surveys, data sets, 
whereby we try to extract public opinion. I'm a retired professor of political science and I've always believed government exists for the Filipino people. And public policies should reflect the Filipino people. And since last year and previous years, but I'd like just to quote some data that we gathered, uh, which we presented uh, the past few years, uh, is that exactly a year and maybe a quarter ago, right before the election season, we, we tracked with one of our survey partners, Social Weather Station, whereby we saw 82% of Filipinos would like us to assert our rights, given our victory in the July 12, 2016 arbitral ruling. And we continue to trust countries that is perceived by Filipinos. That is perceived by Filipinos as allies, partners, friends, which we should continue to harness. That's why in Stratways we believe in a multi-polar world, not limit ourselves to being dragged into China, US strategic rivalry alone. But we also believe that what should be the policy directions? And what came out October of last, of 2021 was, we need to strengthen the military capability of the Philippines, especially the Navy and the Coast Guard, and even have joint maritime patrols and military exercises with allied countries as a top two policy directions of government. Again, this is a national survey that we are quoting, and the newest survey, which will be presented later by one of our, our, our resource person, Professor Holmes, Dr. Holmes of the Pulse Asia, is always a national survey that reflects the demographic of society from class A, B, and C, geographic area, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Then, just July, on the, after the, on the eve of the inauguration of the president, we started, um, we started, uh, we came up with a latest uh, study, so, given the new government, we, which we presented in our conference on July 12, last year, whereby we saw the increase in numbers, ne nearly nine out of 10 Filipinos would like Marcos administration to assert our rights. So we have tracked this since 2016, and we will continue to track it to show that there, there's consistency on the part of uh, the public, the Philippine public. And, and part of that questions that we asked last time was, uh, do we think uh, they must us invest in the capability of the Philippine Navy and the Philippine Coast Guard. 90% says yes. So it's uh, something that policymakers, both the executive, the legislature, who is in charge of appropriations, should really take note of. And, uh, and on another question that we had, uh, which is my next slide, should we form alliances? with countries to defend Philippine territorial rights and West Philippines. 84% says yes. You see, consistent number of eight out of 10 Filipinos, and even nine out of 10 Filipinos. And uh, when you look at, again, what's our latest data that was June on who do we trust, it remains to be our strong allies and partners, the United States, Australia, Japan, and the country that is being visited by the president at this moment as the least trusted, consistent since uh, over a decade of tracking this issue. So, so when we do a comparative, it has even increased since 2021. So, when, at the end of uh, this year, I, we came up with, with our strat-based brief to end the year, which 
we entitled the Philippines and the Indo-Pacific, sustaining multilateral cooperation with allies and partners. And I'd like to quote what we wrote. President Marcos Jr. has repeatedly expressed his intent to pursue an independent foreign policy with national interests as a primordial guide. As long as his administration meets that requirement, the country's strategic partnerships and alliances should not be influenced by pressure and interference from other states. It is shaped by the willingness of states to engage in multilateral cooperation to collectively respond to existing and future challenges that may evolve in 2023. Two days ago, I was interviewed by some media, uh, ANC, GMA7, and even Channel News Asia. I was simply consistent with what I was saying when they asked me about the trip of the president. It's good to engage with neighbors, good to develop strong relationship. But at the end of the day, what should, what should shape us is Philippine national interest. And, the Philipp and national interest can only be measured by this data that we continue to present. And the president should be consistent in something that he has said during the campaign of 2022, right after his victory, May of 2022, during his State of the Nation address, that he will assert our maritime rights and protect our territorial integrity. Again, good morning, and hopefully we can have a deep discussion through our speakers, to our participants, both online and in, in, in this venue. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Professor Dean Domanhit. Very important presentation as he laid out the groundwork for the presentation of our next speaker. So our next speaker will be presenting the results of Pulse Asia's fourth quarter survey, particularly in relation to Philippine foreign policy. He is the president of Pulse Asia Research Incorporated and a full professor at the Department of Political Science and Development Studies at the De La Salle University in Manila. He is currently abroad and will be joining us via Zoom today. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Ronald Holmes. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, can I be heard? And is the slide, okay. I see the slides now. Am I audible? Yes, sir, we can hear you. You may uh, proceed with your presentation. Okay, I'll just proceed with the presentation. Hopefully this will not take that much time so that we have more time for the open forum. Uh, to begin with, good morning to everyone. Uh, apologies for not being there. To the members of the diplomatic corps, to our friends from media and civil society, my colleagues and friends from the academe, and to the organizers, the leadership and the staff of Strat-Base ADR Institute. So my task is to present the results of some of the survey questions that we had in the fourth quarter, Ulat Nambayan. This is the regular survey of Pulse Asia that was conducted from the field work, was conducted from November 27 to December 1, 2022, uh, with the sample size of 1,200 uh, randomly selected adult Philippine respondents. The margin of error at 95% confidence level at the national level is pl plus or minus 2.8%. You see the, that the distribution of the sample is the same as what we've done in the past. 300 for each of the sub-national areas, the National Capital Region, the Balas Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. The survey was done through face-to-face -face interviews, uh, as I said, of randomly selected adult Filipino respondents. Before I present the survey findings, in we normally, in the release of our survey results, identify certain events which may have had, uh, and I should stress may have had, an impact or an effect in terms of the public's opinion with regard to certain issues uh, related to foreign relations issues or issues of national security. Maybe the two events that we can, three events that we can point out here are the visits of uh, Bombo Marcos. There were two official trips. The first one was from November 10 to 13. Uh, this was for the 41st as 40th and 41st ASEAN summits held in uh, Cambodia. And the second one is the attendance of Marcos in the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit 
that was hosted by Thailand from the 18th and 19th of November 2022. Uh, a week after, I mean, soon after that, a few days after that, was a visit of the U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris to the Philippines. During the visit, the Vice President reaffirmed the commitment of the United States to our defense partnership, as well as to strengthen the economic ties between our countries. So these are important events that may have resonated with the public closer to the fieldwork that was conducted at the end of November up to early December 2022. Uh, as a general context, in all of our surveys, uh, and this is common, we provide a list of urgent concerns to the respondents and ask the Filipinos which among these, go these concerns the government should immediately address. So there are 16 concerns that are provided to them, and respondents are given up to three choices. In the fourth quarter 2022 survey, as one would note, the primary concern remained to be controlling inflation or controlling the increasing prices of goods and services. This is how it is indicated in our survey questionnaire. This was at the top of the list with more than half of the Filipinos expressing this as the most urgent national concern. The other top concerns are largely gut issues, largely economic issues from pay of workers, the creation of more jobs, and the reduction of poverty. It's almost at the same level as the concern for fighting gap and corruption, addressing involuntary hunger, and fighting criminality. What one could notice from this slide is that the Filipinos, although it's an important concern, do not deem the defense of the integrity of the Philippine territory as urgent as equally urgent as the controlling uh, controlling uh, the increasing prices of commodities. This is something that is understandable, given that their own personal experience would be, at least in late 2022, and even up to now, the most precious item in the Philippines has to be onions. Across the years, we've also tracked this, and we note that the concern for the defense of the integrity of the Philippine territory against foreigners has always been less than the other primary concerns that you find at the top of the list here, from inflation, the pay of workers, the creation of more jobs, and the reduction of poverty. These have always been at the top, except in certain instances when the government itself signals that there's more importance to fighting gap and corruption. This is under the Aquino administration. And for example, under the Duterte administration at the start, fighting criminality. So it seems that it really, if you look at the opinion surveys, some of the concerns that may not be viewed as urgent suddenly become urgent depending on how the president or the chief executive signals the importance or the urgency of these concerns. For many Filipinos, however, the link between territorial integrity and their material welfare may not be as apparent as indicated by their assessment of the importance or urgency of addressing the country's territorial integrity. Let me now go to the questions that we had uh, that were uh, posed by Slack Base. Uh, uh, as Dindo mentioned, we have been the part a partner of Slack Base ADRI uh, across the years. And let me begin with the first of the three questions. The first question is that among the following, which entity should the Marcos administration work with to strengthen security cooperation to defend our national sovereignty in the West Philippine Sea? We identified a number of countries. We allowed in, uh, respondents to identify other uh, nations and even to express that they don't have an opinion because they have insufficient knowledge of the issue. At the top of the heap, of course, is the United States. 84% no? of Filipinos felt that the Marcos administration should strengthen our cooperation in order to defend our sovereignty at, in the West Philippine Sea with the United States. There's not much of a variance across the areas here. Uh, there's a marginally lower agreement uh, in terms of this U.S. being the top partner, but this is still majority, a significant majority of Filipinos in Mindanao or Mindanao once agree that the United States should be the primary entity that we should strengthen our cooperation with. Second is Japan at 52%, 52, half, more than half of the Filipinos agree 
or think that Japan, our relations with Japan should expand in terms of security cooperation. Um, although this is a little bit tricky because Japan has had certain restrictions in terms of its uh, defense, both uh, in terms of its posturing, in terms of security cooperation. And the third set will be a list of five countries where you have about one to one out of four or one out of five Filipinos expressing the need for us to strengthen our security cooperations with Australia, Great Britain, South Korea, even China for this matter, where the president is right now. And he said that he would bring our relations with China to a higher level and the European Union. <clears throat> the second question is with regard to eliciting from the respondents uh, their view as to what measures should the Marcos administration prioritize to effectively address issues in the West Philippine Sea. As it is noted here, it the prime almost I mean half of Filipinos think that the Philippines should increase its military capability. And this is a very important uh, finding uh, uh, in terms of all of this um, options that are stated here. It appears that many Filipinos believe that it is our capability that will determine our um, the extent by which we can defend our territorial integrity and address issues in the West Philippine Sea. Um, second to that would be to conduct joint maritime patrols and military exercises with allied countries. That's the uh, opinion of about a third of the population to fully implement the Visiting Forces Agreement and the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement or EDCA. And the last one, almost at the same level as the third, would be to finalize what has been brewing for quite some time, the Code of Conduct uh, 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 in terms of the South China Sea that has been pending in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Finally, the last question that we ask is what do they think is the most important reason for us to strengthen our ability to defend and protect our seas? The result of this question points to an understanding on the part of the Filipinos that protecting our seas involves essentially two things. One is an issue of sustainable development, of protecting our marine resources and environment. And the other one is the issue of livelihood and income, protecting the rights of peoples and communities in the coastal areas. It is for this reason, if we go back to the urgent concerns, it would not be difficult for us to link the issue of territorial integrity to the material welfare of many Filipinos. Maraming salamat po, and those are the results of our fourth quarter survey. Thank you very much, Dr. Ronald Holmes, for the very interesting presentation. We'll go back to you later, sir. So please join us for uh, stay there, and you'll be joining us again later. Um, but before we proceed to our next speaker, a quick reminder to our guests and participants. Uh, to our attendees here in the venue, you will have your chance to ask questions later to our guests during the open forum. And to our Zoom participants, should you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to send them in the Q&A box located in the lower part of your screen. We'll also try our best to take them up later during the open forum. Moving on to our next speaker, he will be sharing his expertise on international relations and Philippine foreign policy by illustrating the importance of cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. He is a trustee and program convener at the Strat-based ADR Institute and a professor at the De La Salle University, Manila. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Renato De Castro. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have a PowerPoint presentation. So uh, just before I went abroad for my last trip last year, uh, I received a letter from my good friend and my colleague in De La Salle University, uh, Professor Dean Domanhit, to uh, do a presentation specifically on why it is important for the Philippines to foster cooperation among like-minded states. So happened that just a few days ago, my most recent publication just came out, and it's about the role of the United States and, of course, Japan in, you know, basically preventing a radical break in the conduct of Philippine foreign policy 
during the time of the Duterte administration. So I'm not just focusing on one, our formal treaty ally, but of course our also very important security partner. And of course, how both countries, you know, basically work hard to prevent a total pivot to China, to trans, you know, basically I might take is that the goal of if President Duterte had it his way, Cambodia will have a hell of a competitor in Southeast Asia. Thank God that was not happening. Let me do my pre pre presentation first. Okay, slide please. So of course, in the early part, I still remember this. I received call about comparing the trip of President Ferdinand Marcos with you know, what transpired in October 2016 when we had the former president announcing that I'm separating from the United States, China and Russia, here I come. So basically that marked the effort, initial effort for an appeasement policy. Next slide, please. So for him, it's important that we basically relax the request for territorial integrity and what is important is, of course, as what they say, as Mark would say, money, money, money. Okay, economic development. Next slide, please. So this diplomatic strategy was predicated on a calculation that, you know, just like Cambodia, Laos, and other, you know, uh, countries close to China, Pakistan, we have to be interdependent with China. And of course, the goal is to ease any tension in South China Sea, primarily because triggered supposed to be by his predecessor. Next slide, please. So appeasement will require downplaying, of course, contentious issues in the South China Sea. Next slide, please. And more importantly, agreeing to China's mode of resolving dispute, bilateral negotiation, or what the Chinese would call friendly consultation. Next slide, please. Of course, also mean downgrading, distancing the Philippines from its only strategic ally, the United States. And of course, giving more weight to our economic relations with China. Next slide, please. So, of course, this development triggered alarm bells in Tokyo. And, of course, at that time, I was in Washington, D.C., the concern. You know, given the fact that, of course, one is our only treaty ally, the other, of course, is our security partner. Next slide, please. So, Washington and Tokyo share common interests with the Philippines, especially in the light of what's happening in the West Philippine Sea. You know, Chinese efforts to uh, control those land features that will, of course, eventually lead to Chinese control of 85% of the South China Sea, West Philippine Sea. Next slide, please. So, uh, and just give, of course, tribute to the late uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, uh, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, especially during this period, uh, you know, basically a push for continued cooperation with the Philippines. You know, especially a week after President Duterte visited China in Beijing and made that announcement. A week later, he was in Tokyo, and uh, he was, of course, along with other Japanese foreign policy, uh, defense, uh, foreign and defense officials, were trying to convince Duterte, trying to ascertain, what do you mean by separating from the United States? Next slide, please. So then my presentation would examine joint efforts by the United States and Japan. Uh, let's just skip the for uh, sec the second part. Next slide, please. Just let's skip this. Uh, we can discuss this uh, later, of course, when we have to look in terms of the, yeah, this slide is. So again, with the context of what's an alliance, I don't think there's a need to discuss this. Next slide. Let's just proceed to the more important one. So again, we have to understand the alliance in terms of the San Francisco system or the hub and spoke system of alliance. Uh, here in the Philippines, when we tend to look at our security relationship with the U.S. as a bilateral. Ignoring the fact that from the perspective of Washington, they constitute what is called the hub-and-spoke system of alliances. Next slide, please. Okay, let's just uh, ignore this. Next slide. Next slide. Of course, uh, just going back, the main uh, focal point of the hubs-and-spoke system is the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance. Next slide, please. Uh, the context, of course, and this is something that Filipinos should also understand given the light that there's a move within the uh, Marcos administration to reward the Mutual Defense Treaty. The U.S.-Japan Security Treaty has never been amended or rewarded, but of course the alliance relationship had undergone dramatic changes. Let's proceed. Uh, accelerated, of course, uh, from simply focusing on homeland defense, that's primarily the Japanese homeland, now we're looking at the alliance in terms of a third partner. So uh, U.S. and Japan has got the point that they always look in terms of another partner aside from the U.S. 
Japan Security Alliance. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a form of secu security collaboration of like-minded allies is viewed as the extension of the hub and spoke system. And of course, the goal is basically a counterweight against China's growing influence in the region. Next slide, please. So examples of this trilateral relationship include US-Japan, South Korean trilateral, which is of course very pro problematic, given of course the history between Seoul and Tokyo, but that has been uh, improved recently. Then of course you have uh, the US-Japan close relation with Australia to safeguard the security of the Western Pacific. And of course my focus for this uh, morning's presentation will be combined efforts of Japan and the US to boost the Philippines naval and civilian maritime capabilities relative to the South China. This was raised in the survey. Many Filipinos see the importance of improving our you know, own uh, maritime capabilities and we have these two countries effectively assisting the Philippines. Next slide, please. So Tokyo and Washington's motive in developing the uh, Philippine naval capabilities is of course to counter China's growing sea power that thwarts the United States ability to of course act as the offshore strategic balancer, protecting of course the vital sea lanes of trade and communication, not only in the South China Sea, but in the waters of the first island chain. But of course, in 2016, you have a hell of a complication. Next slide. You have of course, the Duterte administration. Okay, let's just uh, breeze through this. So President uh, Duterte at the onset already implied, you know, he would distance the Philippines from the United States. Next slide, please. Uh, pick China for his own official. Unfortunately, of course, the current president is following the path, visiting Beijing first. Next slide, please. Uh, during his visit, President Xi Jinping stressed to President Duterte to cooperate and coordinate their development strategy, of course, within the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative. Next slide, please. And of course, you have this promise by Xi Jinping of $24 billion. So President Duterte basically uh, ignored the continuing Chinese island building activities in the South China Sea as he was lured by Chinese promise of trades of concession grants and investment. Okay, next slide. So uh, how did, of course, the United States or Washington responded to this appeasement policy? Of course, we only have one treaty ally and that is, of course, the United States, based, of course, on the 1951 RPUS Mutual Defense Treaty. Next slide. So the United States you know, we have to credit Washington and Indo, uh, Indo PACOM for its patience. Decided to go along with the Philippine proposal to shift the alliance or orientation, which was geared during the Aquino administration towards territorial defense. Rather, the alliance should focus on counterterrorism, humanitarian, civic action, and engineering operation. Early part. Next slide, please. Uh, U.S. policymakers stretch their patience and focus on two allies' long term interests based on imposing a cost to Chinese military expansionism in the South China Sea, despite efforts of the Philippines to veer away from the alliance. Next slide, please. The U.S., of course, never held security assistance to the Philippines, even during the hype of uh, President Duterte's effort to gain the trust and confidence of China. And of course, the most crucial part was when, of course, you have U.S. military assistance during the siege of Marawi city in 2017. Of course, China provided military equipment, but everyone knows that the AAP said, thanks, but no thanks. They rather use, of course, the, uh, what they got from the United States. Next slide, please. Although President Duterte has a different take regarding this issue. The U.S. continued the task of fostering shared interests with the Philippines in counterterrorism, providing essential military equipment to the Maritime Security Initiative that began during, of course, the Obama administration and specifying in specific terms. Of course, U.S. treaty commitment after, of course, you have secretary. Next slide, please. Okay, let's just go to Japan. Uh, Philippine-Japan uh, security relation is based on June 15th, joint declaration. Next slide. Communique, of course, just proceed. Let's just discuss uh, Japanese effort. Jap Japan was, of course, was concer uh, concerned, uh, was conforming in association with the Philippines that adhere to a rules base freedom navigation, so forth and so on. But of course, you have the sticking point there, President Duterte's effort to pivot towards China. Next slide. And we have to give credit to the late Japanese Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, who personally engaged President Duterte as early as, you know, in Laos, then when President Duterte went to Tokyo, and of course, when uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe even went to Dabao and eat durian 
with President Duterte, just to engage him. Next slide. And of course, assistance. So what basically prevented? Okay, number one, of course, the U.S. and Japan, through their respective security ties, were able to strengthen the capabilities of the armed forces. We don't have the time to discuss in details what were provided. Of course, the armed forces of the Philippines is one of the important institutions that was, of course, realistic enough and cleared eyes enough to see the danger of gravitating clo uh, closer to China. Next slide. Uh, the trust of China run deep in the Philippine society as reflected in the survey and, of course, especially in the military circle. Next slide. Uh, AFP capitalized on Japanese and American security assistance when finally, in uh, early 2021, during the Winston Shoal incident, the Duterte administration realized the folly of appeasing China. Hopefully, this administration would not fall to that trap again. And, of course, the AFP was able to react because of the equipment. My conclusion, basic conclusion, okay? Tokyo and Washington demonstrated patience and persistence with dealing with the initially pro-China administration of Prime, uh, President Duterte. After the next slide, both the U.S. and Japan share mutual interests, despite the fact that at the time, the Duterte administration did not realize it. Of, of course, uh, the fact that we have to deal with China's maritime expansion in the South China Sea, and appeasement simply does not work. Our last slide. Uh, in the face of the Duterte administration's early efforts to appease, the U.S. and Japan uh, cooperate and closely resuit, uh, and of course, with consistency with the Philippine military to ensure that the sea lanes of the West Philippine, Western Pacific remain safe, open, and secure for all countries in the region. And I think this is the last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very insightful presentation, sir. <laughs> and on to our next speaker. He will give an overview of the current security landscape in the West Philippine Sea. He will also be sharing his knowledge on how to capitalize on data to secure our waters. He is from the Gordian Knot Center for National Security Innovation, Project Mushu, at the Stanford University, California, USA. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us via Zoom, let us welcome Colonel Raymond Powell, U.S. Air Force retired. Well, hello, good morning. Uh, it's good afternoon from where I am here in California. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, take a few minutes to talk about uh, Project Mushu, which is a project uh, being conducted here at Stanford University at the Gordian Knot Center for National Security Innovation. And where our process has led us is to the, the topic of how to light up the gray zone, the maritime gray zone in the Philippines in particular, which is where we've been spending most of our time. So what is the gray zone and why do we care? Well, uh, we've been talking about uh, the maritime gray zone in the West, West Philippine Sea and the actions of uh, the Philippines' big neighbor. But what is true that we know is true is that bad actors always benefit when, it's, when the gray zone is gray. The reason that you see those low numbers when it comes to uh, how uh, many people consider defending uh, Philippine national territorial sovereignty uh, is because it's just not in their consciousness all the time. They, they have other concerns. And so that's good for the gray zone actors. That's good for China when they want to coerce, when they want to bully. But we actually have something that we can do about that because we're in the middle of an open source data explosion. You can see some of the things on the screen here. These are a lot of the, the new emerging commercial and uh, NGO provided s systems and services that can help us understand and shape and analyze and act on what we can find out about what's in the gray zone. And so that leads us to the, the concept that our, that our team has developed, which we, we're calling Sea Light. And that's essentially having a community of open source collectors and analysts for, to light up the gray zone. And we do it by using this technology and, and connecting with these data providers, by being involved with the public and with ad advocacy groups who, who represent them, by being involved with research centers and journalists, and even with government agencies who can uh, receive the information that, that, that we are able to dig up and perhaps even act on some of the things that we can provide to them. So let me give you a couple of examples of the kinds of things that we can know uh, based on this newly available commercial uh, capability. 
You may recall that about six months ago, uh, a Philippine Inquirer reporter was allowed to go out to uh, Ayungin Shoal, Second Thomas Shoal, um, with a uh, resupply boat. This, uh, we know that these happen all the time, but it's very rare that, that a reporter is allowed to go out with them. And so she was able to write uh, a, a two very long and interesting articles about her experience there. And it, it, was, uh, it was really well done. But there was a lot there that she didn't know because what she could see was what she could see from the supply boat. What we can tell you, based on what we're able to, to, to get from commercially available technology, is all of the other things she didn't see. But first, let's set the, set the stage. So for those who aren't aware, Amgen Shoal is uh, about 20 mi nautical miles from Mischief Reef. And, and there on Ayungan Shoal is the BRP Sierra Madre. And it's been there for over 20 years uh, and has a small contingent of service members who uh, keep the Philippine flag flying there at Ayungan Shoal. Well, 20, 20 nautical miles away is a much more substantial uh, military base that uh, the PRC has at Mischief Reef and it is able to use that military base to house its maritime militia and its Coast Guard uh, and keep it constantly uh, circling and surveilling the uh, Sierra Madre and basically act as the gatekeepers so that any Philippine resupply mission has to go through a gauntlet of Chinese ships. So let's take you to a couple of days before the resupply mission. This is a pretty standard layout of what, was, what, what tends to happen uh, around uh, Ayungin Shoal. Uh, we have one uh, Coast Guard ship, uh, Chinese Coast Guard ship, uh, constantly sort of right on the horizon, keeping an eye on what's going on, ready to respond to anything that it doesn't like. And nearby, near uh, Mischief Reef, you have a couple of active uh, maritime militia. Now there are more maritime militia that tend to be inactive at Mischief Reef, and there are lots of other maritime militia at other, at other uh, military bases in the South China Sea, but these are the ones which were active on this day. By the way, we got this information from uh, Starboard Maritime Intelligence, which is a fairly new technology company out of New Zealand, which is doing a great job of curating and uh, verifying information and making it available uh, for, uh, for their customers. So one day before the actual resupply mission, 19th of June, we have a second Chinese Coast Guard ship shows up from the north. Why did it pick this particular day to show up? We can only speculate. But interestingly, something else happens. We have a Philippine Coast Guard ship that just happens to be on its way by Ayungin Shoal. Again, I don't know why they chose this particular route to go to the other uh, features that they were going to visit, but they did come fairly close to Ayungin Shoal. And this seemed to get the, uh, the, the first Chinese Coast Guard ship's attention. And so he goes out to sort of let, let the, the Habagat know that they shouldn't get any closer because this is their territory. This is what that, so we can actually sort of verify this even using satellite technology. Satellites, uh, satellite photos are difficult to use when it comes to maritime problems because ships move and satellites only go over once in a while. There are lots of clouds. There's lots of things that get in the way of being able to, to, to verify things using satellites. But on this day, it was a pretty clear day and we were able to match up the times. And fortunately, the, the satellite went over at a, at a good time for us to be able to see the, co the Chinese Coast Guard ship uh, using this uh, service called Planet. All right, so this is the day that the resupply boat shows up. Now the boat itself is small and it does not require the AIS system that other larger uh, ships are supposed to be broadcasting at all times. So you, you don't actually see the resupply boat uh, on the, um, the Starboard Maritime Intelligence uh, report because it, it, there's no AIS to, 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 uh, to be able to track it. You do see two new uh, ships come from the Philippines, which are the two Coast Guard ships. Now the Suluan probably is a lot for closer in, but it, for some reason uh, unknown to me, uh, its AIS system stops transmitting partway in. So, uh, it may actually be sitting right next to the, to the Capones, but uh, we, will, we, we can't know by this, uh, by this report. You can see now that four additional maritime militia ships from Subi Reef show up and they decide to hang out right over by Mischief Reef 
seeming to sort of just make sure that they're close enough to respond should things go in a way that China doesn't approve. One of the maritime militia ships previously in the Ship Reef goes over toward Iungan Shoal and actually goes on the other side of it, uh, joining the Chinese Coast Guard ships just to interpose themselves between the Capones and the, uh, and the Suluan uh, and make sure that only the small resupply boat is able to get through. Again, all of this is not uh, are, is what does not make it into the reporter's re uh, report because she can't see any of this. What she can see is what she can see from her um, from her uh, her post on the on the resupply boat itself. Now you may say, well, I mean, that's it. That's all very interesting, and I, but I kind of knew about the uh, resupply mission and I, I I read it, and so let me tell you something that maybe you didn't know. Uh, recently, there was a confrontation uh, about a month ago between uh, a Chinese Coast Guard vessel and the Andres Bonifacio uh, right by Panatag or Scarborough Shoal. Here's another picture from uh, Scarborough Maritime Intelligence that we were able to, 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 uh, to draw from the experience that happened on that day. And you can see that the Andres Bonifacio get, comes in from the northeast and uh, moves down toward in the direction of Scarborough Shoal. The unknown ship here is actually China Coast Guard ship 3303. The reason it's labeled unknown is that a couple of days ago, for uh, they, a, day, a couple of days prior to this, for unknown reasons, it changed its AIS signal, swapping two numbers around. So it's now reflective as unknown, but it's clearly the same ship. So it comes out and it puts itself again between the Bonifacio and uh, Panatag Shoal. And the two ships converge uh, to about 800 meters. They go from north to south, uh, and then eventually the Bonifacio peels off and returns back to the Philippines. As far as I know, this was never reported or um, was never uh, discussed, uh, but we are able to find out because this, these are the kinds of tools that are now available to us. So why did I tell you about all that? Well, as was um, highlighted by Dr. Holmes' excellent uh, survey report, uh, an engaged public is a key to, to deterring China and to building national res resilience so that when people answer those survey questions, it's not just a couple of people who say, this is really important to us. Uh, the quantity and the quality of the information that we can get, that we can now get is going up and the costs of that information are coming down and making it more accessible. Therefore, we can know a lot more right now about what's happening in Philippine waters. We just need to know where to look how to interpret it, and then how to tell the story, and that's really our concept. How do we put ourselves in the midst of this, this great technology, uh, communicate with the people who are most engaged, and shape the, the messages so that, that people can understand what's actually happening? So I'd like to uh, invite you to take note of my email address and feel free to contact me at any time. We're, we're continuing to build our concept out, and uh, over the next year, we hope to bring it into reality. Let help uh, uh, help join us and help us light up the gray zone. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Colonel Powell. Very interesting uh, presentation, especially the last part, the one about the December eighth. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, so, moving on to our next speaker, uh, he will discuss how the Indo-Pacific strategies of various states can contribute to the peace, stability, and security of the region. He is the president and founder of the International Development and Security Cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Chester Cabalza. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the ADRI for inviting me uh, for this uh, important occasion. I'll be discussing about this topic on leveraging the Indo-Pacific strategies for uh, achieving a stable uh, region. Uh, basically, when we talk about uh, leverage, uh, it opens up a lot of opportunities. And of course, we're widening the uh, weight and clout of uh, member countries within this region and how they would uh, want to achieve this uh, stability in the region. And uh, basically, um, Let's uh, move to the next uh, slide to show you um, what are the uh, features of this Indo-Pacific uh, region. Uh, um, basically, um, when we talk about uh, strategy, it uh, designs and operationalizes uh, the, um, the um, national objectives, uh, national policy, be it foreign policy or security policy. And uh, uh, 
um, national interest of, a, of any sovereign state. And uh, in here, we would uh, see that uh, in discussing about the Indo-Pacific region, uh, there are some uh, factors where we um, see common features on the maritime power projection, security, trade, and environmental policies, which we will see in some of the trajectories of other uh, major powers on how they look at their Indo-Pacific strategies later on. Let's move to the next slide to show you some of the uh, literatures when it comes to uh, the topic of Indo-Pacific. If you try to look at it, there are 14 uh, countries that are members or within that Indo-Pacific region, and uh, most of these countries are uh, uh, coming from uh, middle and upper middle uh, income economies and uh, most likely we will see that the Indo-Pacific region uh, will become the greatest and uh, the future engines of our global economy. So the, uh, that would be the projection uh, basically. Now let's look at the next slide. So uh, again, um, most of those countries within the region are the world's largest economies and uh, of course, um, notwithstanding that uh, China is also included in the, the uh, periphery of that Indo-Pacific uh, geography. But uh, you can see here that uh, you have uh, India, Japan, Indonesia, South Korea, Thailand, Australia, Taiwan, Malaysia, and of course the Philippines. Now let's move to the next slide. Um, again, economics would become the lifeblood in operationalizing the uh, um, political and strategic interests of these nations. And uh, we also see here the um, um, proposal of uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, although uh, recently you have also the uh, Belt Road Initiative uh, coming from China and the RCEP or the Regional uh, uh, Cooperation and um, Economic uh, Partnership uh, led by China. But in here, you will see that uh, most of the countries um, in the Indo-Pacific region are um, um, uh, subscribe to the um, IPEF. And um, when we talk about that, let's move to the next slide here. Okay, um, again, it's going to be uh, the center of global trade and commerce, and uh, the Indo-Pacific region is perceived to be the, the future of the world. And uh, uh, therefore, we will see a potential area of, of, of economic prosperity and uh, for the countries in the region. So these are just fast facts about the region. 65% of the world's population are here, 63% of the world's GDP, and 46% of the world's merchandise trade. So many say that it's really dynamic uh, when we talk about this Indo-Pacific region. Let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, um, I uh, since... Um, when we talk about the strategy, um, basically it, it starts with a concept and then you try to operationalize it and it becomes a way of life because it's part of the narrative and it becomes a strategic culture. So these are some of the right things about the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, uh, Indo um, Rory, uh, he's a med call, he's an Australian analyst. He said that uh, there's nothing new about the Indo-Pacific because it's already there and uh, I think it's just a new region. So, um, member countries uh, wanted to be part of it because it becomes uh, prestigious for them to be part because it's going to be the, uh, the, the most dynamic and most prosperous region in the world uh, today and in the future. Okay, let's move to the next slide to show you. Uh, again, Rory, I would say that it's an Asian maritime super region and uh, others would say that uh, uh, when we talk about Asia uh, in the Pacific, it's, it's naval rather than continental. Although, of course, you have China there who thinks that uh, everything is still continental, but uh, it's going to be uh, a naval uh, perspective because most of those uh, uh, powers who projected their uh, Indo-Pacific strategies are naval powers, basically. So, you will see that. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Um, again, part of the conceptual framework uh, on the Indo-Pacific, it says that uh, this is Asia's strate strategic reality for the past two uh, 200 years. So, I mean, let's say that uh, even before they have already um, um, uh, thought about that, it just so happened that you have a name now which is called the Indo-Pacific. Okay, let's move to the uh, next slide. Uh, it is envisioned uh, to be uh, a geographic space to be one of the singular strategic region. Uh, of course, before uh, you have Asia Pacific, now it has changed and renamed into Indo-Pacific because of the importance of India. And of course, uh, giving uh, also India is uh, projected to become the second uh, largest economy in the future. And uh, of course, uh, one of the active um, and major actors in the region, um, of course, uh, with their uh, participation in the Quad and in AUKUS. And we will see later on what would be the projections of India in the Indo-Pacific region. Okay, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, so. It's still a debate. Some would say that uh, it's a conceptual framework. Others would say that it's a geographic reality. It depends on whose side are you 
um, hearing from it. Of course, uh, there are some uh, the Russians, the Chinese would say that it's uh, these are um, uh, 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 these are just constructs. But of course, um, allied uh, uh, members and of course those like-minded uh, nations would think that it's a reality already. So of course, there's a terminological shift uh, for the region. We see power play of major states. That's the reason why, uh, as of the moment, we still see the uh, power rivalry between the United States and China in the region. And of course, some would say that uh, it renewed uh, the importance of the U.S. by re renaming the Indo-Pacific region or the U.S. Pacific Command to Indo-Pacific region. So the mere fact that they changed the name, that means that um, it exists. You know, in, in, in linguistics, they say that if a word exists, then it's part of the culture. So I mean, let's say that it is part of the world culture now when we talk about Indo-Pacific, okay? Because it's part of our vocabulary now. Okay, let's move to the next uh, slide. Okay. Thanks to um, uh, Shinjo Abe, uh, the late uh, Shinjo Abe, um, Japan was one of the first states to project the notion of open and free Indo-Pacific. And he called the Indo-Pacific region as the sea of prosperity, but he wanted to be governed by freedom, rule of law, the market economy that is free from force or coercion because of their um, antagonistic experiences with China and also they wanted uh, India to play a major role uh, because India is a giant country in Asia that can uh, compete with uh, China, basically. And we will see that. Uh, before he um, passed away, let's move to the next uh, slide. Uh, we, will, uh, we saw that uh, he has a very active um, relations with uh, China, uh, with India. And um, in here, when we talk about the Indo-Pacific, it's not only the story of China's rise. It's also the story of India's rise. And you will see that India's vision of the Indo-Pacific is an extension of its look is now called the uh, act is policy. But the difference of India to other member uh, or other major powers in the Indo-Pacific is that they wanted to maintain that multipolar Indo-Pacific that will uh, serve as the best platform for their own interest. Of course, we know for a fact that uh, India has been playing a lot in terms of their non-alignment policy and that's the reason why that uh, um, they have their own temperament and their uh, own decision when it comes to their multilateralism in the, in the world, basically. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Okay, ASEAN also has its own Indo-Pacific uh, strategy and uh, they embrace that through their ASEAN outlook at the Indo-Pacific. And they have four strategies, namely maritime cooperation, connectivity, sustainable development, and economy. Okay, that was the projection. Okay, next slide. Now, the Europeans came in and they started to tell their own narratives on the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, Germany would want to talk about the role of multilateralism because of um, they wanted to delimit their dependencies on raw materials and technologies abroad because of their experiences in the Russia-Ukraine war and also because they wanted to ex uh, expand their, um, their clout in the region. And because of that, they wanted to emphasize on multilateralism and commitments to the expansion of regional and sustainable infrastructure initiatives. Okay, let's move to the next slide. I think this uh, would be my uh, second to the last slide. Um, before, uh, France, the UK also had the Indo-Pacific tilt. They wanted to maintain their influence in Asia, but uh, France uh, in 2018 uh, crafted their Indo-Pacific strategy where they would want to address the issue of sovereignty. And it concerns about uh, freedom of navigation, security, connectivity, economics, and the environment. We know for a fact that uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, it becomes the meta center of environment because of course of the West Philippine Sea, the South China Sea, where of course it's the meta center when it comes to ecology. And of course, we are also discussing about the blue uh, ocean economy here. Okay, let's move to the next uh, slide. What about the Philippines? I think uh, there was a question last time uh, by a French uh, friend uh, among some um, scholars here in the Philippines. Do you have, a, do you have an Indo-Pacific strategy? And uh, Filipino scholars look at each other. And in fact, we don't still have, no? And, but, you know, for the Philippines, since we are a major actor also in this region, we see it as an international net, uh, network of like-minded countries. And we are uh, playing it uh, in different ways, but uh, these are some of the um, reasons. We know that there are power shift and power transitions from COVID, and uh, there are um, uh, signs of confrontation growing to challenge uh, the rising power. Um, and of course, lastly, would be the Philippines is at the center of this in the Pacific. 
region. So I'll end it there. I'll listen to your questions later, and, uh, and then hopefully we can uh, um, contribute to this uh, discourse on the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cabalza, for that very insightful presentation. So at this point, we will now start the open forum part of our discussion. But before that, we'll have to clear up our area here. So if we could ask assistance, please. So we would like to ask our speakers again to join us back here uh, in front, Professor Dindo Manhit, Dr. De Castro, please, and Dr. Cabalza. And also with us, still joining us online, Dr. Holmes and Colonel Powell. They are still with us online, I believe, and will be joining us also during the open forum. So again, for our attendees here in the venue, you will have a chat. Uh, if you have questions that you want to ask, uh, kindly inform our team members there at the back so they can assist you. Uh, in asking the questions, and to our Zoom participants, should you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to send them in the Q&A box located in the lower part of your screen. We'll try our best to answer them later during the open forum, okay? So I think we're still waiting for Professor Manhit, or he'll follow. Okay, I think he's in the call right now. Okay, mm. okay, we'll start. Ready, sir? <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we can ask first the question to, do we have Dr. Holmes uh, and Colonel Powell also online? Are they still with us? Yes, we're here. Yes, okay, thank you. So I, I guess our first question is for Dr. Holmes and Dr. De Castro. Um, in your opinion, how should the West Philippine Sea issues be prioritized in the Philippine foreign, in Philippine foreign policy? Maybe Dr. De Castro would like to answer first. Okay. Uh, this is based on what Professor Holmes mentioned. The public generally get their signal from the government. So the government would basically have to set the priority. So that's how the issue would, of course, be uh, taken into account by the general public. By themselves, the public had a limited, you know, basically what I would call a uh, snapshot view of international relations. It's basically the government. And a good example, of course, of how the West Philippine issue became an issue that the country should focus on was done by a president, a late president, who was actually reluctant to get involved in foreign policy issue. And that's no, no less than the late President Benigno Aquino, who even announced uh, in the, one of his State of the Nation address of the importance of Recto Bank when he mentioned this. So that became a very important issue. The Philippine public got glued to that issue. So, uh, you know, that's a reality we have to take into account when we talk about foreign policy. It had to be, take, uh, it had to be, uh, it's, you know, people would generally take their cue from the government. How about Dr. Holmes? How do you think should the West Philippine Sea issue be prioritized in our Philippine foreign policy? Well, I think I agree with uh, Dr. De Castro. It essentially is a, you know, it can only be taken as priority by the public or urgent by the public depending on the statement or the emphasis given by the main policy player, and this happens to be the president. Um, of course, presidents tend to play politics more often than not, uh, and that's not, not something that we can eliminate, but as noted by Professor Picasso himself, you know, when Norja Aquino took up the issue involving to the arbitral tribunal, that made it, made it very clear that this is an important national issue. Uh, and it, it really it needs to be prioritized, and it has to be linked to the basic issues that Filipinos give importance to, and it's livelihood uh, and uh, income. Because, you know, uh, one of the things that has been mentioned in past fora is that, you know, the area also has so much of um, uh, this uh, resources that the Philippines could benefit from. And if we lose the, those territories, the Philippines will be in terms of gas, the Philippines will be at the losing end. So those are the things that maybe the government should articulate rather than just the private sector or civil society groups uh, emphasizing. Yes, very important, sir. Now I would like to ask Colonel Powell and Dr. Cabalza here with us today. 
What are the different ways forward in maritime and defense cooperation between the Philippines and other uh, like-minded states? And as a follow-up, sir, how do you think will joint patrols contribute to the peace and stability of the West Philippine Sea? As we saw in the Pulse Asia survey, survey earlier, these are the measures that many Filipinos believe would really help defend our uh, national sovereignty. Yeah, ever since uh, we've been pushing for the uh, participation of the um, um, Navy and of course with the uh, Marines and of course uh, lately uh, with the uh, Philippine Coast Guard. And uh, these uh, maritime um, law enforcement agencies are very uh, important in, uh, in terms of how they would actualize uh, the uh, foreign policy and security policy of the country. So the mere fact that we are uh, involving them now and uh, now uh, they have uh, come into a realization that they play a major and important role also in the national security of the country, then uh, modernizing the armed forces uh, is really important. And uh, that's the reason why they are doing it right now. And um, maritime joint patrol is very important because of course uh, you have also stages, layers in the, on the ground. No? Uh, of course you have the, the brown uh, water, the blue ocean so far. And of course uh, in terms of our um, um, operations in the, uh, uh, at sea, uh, it varies also uh, depending on uh, whose ships um, are uh, on the uh, on the ground there. So basically, uh, we have to uh, to really um, uh, empower these um, law enforcement uh, agencies uh, so that uh, uh, we can protect the uh, territorial integrity of our country. Thank you, sir. Colonel Powell, would you like to add some more things? What are the ways forward in maritime and defense cooperation between the Philippines and other like-minded states, sir? All right, thank you, sir. Since we're talking about alliances, I would like to go back to the uh, survey presented by Policy Asia earlier, and also the survey results presented by uh, Professor Dindo Manhit from 2021 and early uh, 2022. So as shown in the presentations, the United States, Australia, Japan, and South Korea are consistently high on surveys that look at countries. Filipinos believe the government must work with closely. Why is this so? Maybe uh, Dr. Holmes and Ms. maybe even Dr. De Castro and Dr. Cabalza can give us uh, their insights. Uh, why is this so? May, can we start with Dr. Holmes, sir? I would refer to the IR experts in this area. Of course, uh, generally, of course, in terms of the overall relationship we have. Uh, the United States, of course, historically. Japan, historically, too. Uh, level of interaction, but I will not discount the role of what I call the transnational, especially uh, in terms of Japan and, of course, the United States. The I call the Trans-Pacific Connection, where you have, you know, in case of the United States, you have four million Americans who trace their ethnic roots in the Philippines, and also in the case of Japan, especially during the, I don't know if you still remember the phenomenon of them, we use the term Japayuki. You know, we have a lot, I have a lot of students in De La Salle University who obviously have uh, uh, Japanese parents based on their surnames. 
So uh, both factors also in South Korea, the fact that we have the Filipino diaspora and a number of those Filipinos who decided to leave the country are now based on those countries, aside from the official diplomatic high-level interactions we have with those countries. Uh, again, we also have to look into account in terms of history. And I would like to raise a question, why China is always at the bottom, despite the fact that you have a lot of you know, Chinese Filipinos who trace their ancestry to China. Uh, again, this is something rooted in the uh, memory of the Filipinos, that uh, the South China Sea issue, especially, of course, given the fact that, especially during the time of the Aquino administration, uh, after uh, when we filed the case against China, and of course when the ruling came out in 2016. So this is my take. Uh, I have uh, three points here. Uh, one would be uh, the uh, linguistic value of all the uh, maritime challenges that we have uh, seen in the South China Sea. One, of course, is the uh, prevalence of the words on um, interoperability and then freedom of navigation. This has become part of our uh, narratives, uh, vocabularies, day-to-day -day conversations. And then uh, secondly, it, it's not only about economics here. Even if China is now the number two economy in the world and is projected to become the number one, if you ask people around the world, where do you want to migrate, they won't choose China, of course. They would rather go to to, to these uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, members of these Indo-Pacific countries except China. So meaning to say that it's about livability, it's about acceptability of these um, of these great powers. And I think the third point here is about uh, how do we see the future? Um, even if um, we're discussing about uh, alliances, the Indo-Pacific uh, in this uh, discourse right now, uh, I think uh, the most important is um, what would be the scenario in the future if in case China uh, would be at, on the top? Uh, is China going to change also? Is it going to alter its position? Is it going to, um, to, to mediate some differences with the Indo-Pacific? Because at the end of the day, it's not only, no man is an island here. It's not only about China. Uh, we see the rise of uh, India and the ASEAN and the Indo-Pacific generally. So China should also uh, learn from this, uh, from, 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 from this one. So those are my comments basically. Um, we have a related question from one of our online participants for Dr. Cabalza and Dr. De Castro. Does friend to all enemies to none make sense to provide strategic guidance to a foreign policy that prioritizes national interest? Or if not, what one-liner could perhaps be an alternative? <laughs> uh, I would usually say it is a foreign policy rhetoric. I would say it's a goal that you would like to attend. Uh, but whether you could attain that goal or not, usually in case of foreign policy, in policy science, you have to mention this, uh, what I will call the holy grail of foreign policy. But of course, that's the holy grail. You know, we don't have a uh, Sir Galahad to basically reach that goal because all of us, of course, had been tainted. So, uh, but whether that goal is could be achieved or not, of course, is an, another matter. And of course, it's more challenging for the Philippines given the fact that we cannot be friends to all and enemy to none because for the simple reason we have a formal treaty alliance. You know, we cannot be neutral because we have a treaty alliance with the United States. And of course, we have security partnership. And I, I think, you know, surprisingly when I was, uh, you know, I also teach in the National Defense College and I was pleasantly surprised when in the armed forces of the Philippines, when the army said, you know, what's basically, a, you know, what's the, your category for a security partnership? They said, we also all value like-minded states. So that automatically removed one state from being uh, like-minded like us. Now, I won't have to mention it, much to the consternation of some people here. But, you know, that's a reality we have to uh, take into account, you know, like-minded states. So... Uh, I think that's a key point when you talk about in terms of uh, importance of, you know, alliance. Uh, uh, for me, uh, the, the friends to all and me to none is a simple uh, saying of uh, a neutrality policy. But of course, we cannot afford a neutrality policy until 2028. 
especially that there is a competing uh, likeness coming from these two rival powers. Uh, they are getting our attention. It's like courting, uh, they are courting us. So you have to say yes to one. You cannot uh, be with two partners. That is impossible to do. And it's going to be a headache for the Philippines. So until such a time, we come into a, re a realization that uh, we think that one is the best for us, then uh, that's the time we will decide for our foreign policy that would uh, suit the interests of the country. Can I Go ahead, sir. add some more? Yeah. And this is what I mentioned to some of my students in the National Defense College. It's a good rhetoric. In a way, it's a propaganda. But the danger there is if you start believing your own propaganda. All right. Thank you, sir. So we have another question. This one is for Colonel Powell. We still have Colonel Powell, sir. It seems that Chinese encroachments in Mischief Reef and Scarborough Shoal are now accepted as facts on the ground, or at least on water. There are no remedies suggested to change the current status quo. Please comment. How will Project Mushu also contribute to this? Yeah, you know, th so that really was sort of the foundation of how we looked at the, the general security problem in the South China Sea. <clears throat> since I've been looking at the South China Sea since the late 80s, um, it, the, the, the problem has changed a great deal. <coughs> uh, so there was a time when what we were mostly concerned about was the individual features and how, how everybody had their own claims and who would resolve the claims. But since the, uh, the growth of, one is uh, China's aggressive nine dash line claim, which really kind of burst into the, um, into the mainstream in 2009 when it filed a response to Vietnam and Malaysia's continental shelf claims uh, that basically said the nine dash line belongs, is, is, is China's and we have historic rights to it. And then the growth of its uh, Coast Guard and maritime militia in, so that it could now push out to the edges of the nine dash line deep into other nations' uh, exclusive economic zones and especially that of the Philippines. And it's able to sort of be the local constabulary it's because it's there all the time. And using these, this very large maritime militia, this very large Coast Guard, which is not a Coast Guard in the same way that we think of a Coast Guard, and also using these bases that it's built out into ports that can shelter those, that can refuel those, they can basically stay in the area all the time rather than having to go all the way back to Hainan Island. So yeah, so when we took a look at how to start to change the, um, the, the, the problem set, where we ended up was China needs to be paying a much higher reputational cost for what it's doing. And it can't do that for as long as it gets to operate largely in the gray zone. So for as long as its activities mostly escape public notice it gets it get, kind of just gets away from from it, and I appreciate the question because w as we've all kind of come to accept it as fact, we no longer react to the fact that there is a foreign power occupying a feature that is in the Philippines' exclusive economic zone and pushing out uh, and basically acting as the owners of that feature. Uh, there was a great uh, I just was watching a great. Uh, uh, news report on the plight of the fishermen uh, that go out to Scarborough Shoal and how they're not able to bring their large boats in there anymore. And they're, th they basically have to bring a whole bunch of extra fuel in order to get their smaller boats back and forth and how badly it has affected their livelihoods. And this is the kind of thing that Project Mushu and our sea light concept is meant to figure out how do we find other ways to illuminate this so that China's reputational costs can be higher and the Philippines national resilience can be stronger. Okay, thank you very much, Colonel Powell. And we also have another question here from one of our online participants. This one is for Dr. Holmes. Um, sir, if the people take their cue from the government, how can the government make this security issue a primary focus of government and have the people rally behind uh, efforts to address this issue? You know, there are venues that the president, or I mean, the chief executive can use. Um, and these are in policy speeches. Um, and normally, you have the annual State of the Nation address. That is the time when the president articulates 
what the conditions of the country is, what needs to be done from their end as well as from Congress. So as I mentioned already, it's essentially the president that will signal whether this is an important issue that requires a constituency and the constituency can be mobilized. Uh, we've had several, when Colonel Powell initially was discussing some of the skirmishes that happened recently, but we've had a government that's been quiet about it. You know? uh, if government publicizes, for example, the actions that it has taken, the diplomatic protests that it has filed, then that will generate much more attention on the part of the public. Unfortunately, those types of diplomatic initiatives have not in any way been publicized by government. Uh, instead, you have some um, ambiguous, no, ambivalent statements, such as the one that was mentioned earlier, you know, friend to all, enemy to none. Uh, you cannot in any way just tolerate incursions in, ter in, ter in your territory. You have to be very uh, categorical about protesting it. And I think the protestor here, protestant here would be essentially the most important one would be the president. Okay, very much, thank you, uh, Dr. Holmes. Very much related to what you said, we have a, que we have a question for Dr. Cabalza and Dr. De Castro. Um, do you think that, do you think President Marcos uh, Jr. did enough to raise the concern of the Philippines over the South China Sea or West Philippines uh, incident, West Philippine Sea incidences or tensions, especially now that he's in China based on the information that we've been getting so far, sir? Do you think he has done enough? I will have to do it in a comparative manner. Compared to the previous one, definitely, yes. And he started with, you know, even before he became president, where at least he acknowledged the ruling. It took the former president almost four years before he uh, acknowledged the arbitral ruling. Uh, the current president at least did it at, even before he uh, was sworn into office. And you know, every now and then, uh, at least you have the Department of Foreign Affairs, the secretary, acknowledging the ruling on the, uh, its uh, anniversary this year. And you even have the Solicitor General, uh, what's his name, Secretary Gebala, saying that the whole government supports the ruling. And you have a specific budget item in the Department of Foreign Affairs that would uh, basically uh, be focused on international forum wherein the Department of Foreign Affairs would raise the arbitral ruling. So, uh, you know, compared to what happened in the past, this is something substantive. And uh, at least the president, although I really found it naive when he said that I'm going to China, talk with Xi Jinping, and uh, we will try to resolve. Uh, that's very naive because it will take generation before this issue could not be resolved short of actual conflict. So uh, the most at least he's, you know, he's mentioning the fact that he would talk with Xi Jinping. Of course, the next question there, whether he would have the same reaction by President Xi Jinping when President uh, Duterte raised the arbitral ruling in August 2019, this last state visit to China. So the chances are they will just agree to disagree, but nevertheless, that came out in at least in the public discourse regarding his visit to Beijing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, of course, um, for me, um, recalling his uh, campaign um, slogan on unity, I think he meant it in terms of, we know for a fact that uh, the arbitration uh, award was pursued by the Aquino administration. And you know the family feud between the two. Even if it came from Aquino, he realized the importance of this arbitration award for the interest of the Philippines. Meaning to say that he's genuine, strategic, and clever. He learned from the previous experience of his predecessor by too much pivoting to China. Now he try to balance the uh, foreign policy, and it's up to him now to decide on what's next for the country, uh, since it will come into a full, full circle now, uh, given that we heard the narratives of the Americans, the Europeans, and now the Chinese. Today, they will be discussing, I think, the security issues after they discussed the economic deals yesterday in China. But um, the mere fact, as uh, mentioned by Dr. De Castro, uh, uh, going to China to discuss abo about the security, I think that is also uh, an absurd um, 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 uh, how would I experience because of course 
um, President Duterte, knowing that uh, he's so strong during his time, also did the same thing, but uh, we got a very straight response from China that they will still continue with what they want in the South China Sea. So meaning to say that China will still continue uh, with, uh, their, um, uh, with uh, their perseverance to get what they want in the South China Sea. And uh, the only thing we have to do is to discern well of, of what kind of foreign policy we will do and to strengthen our armed forces. That's the remedy that uh, I can think right now. Thank you. But just to follow up, are you both satisfied with what the current administration is doing? Or do you think there is a need to push harder? Because as shown in the Pulse Asia surveys, uh, the people, more than 80%, want the government to really assert their rights in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, well, the mere fact that he changed his earlier position. Remember when he made a statement disparaging of the arbitral ruling in February uh, 2022, then he changed his position after, of course, he got elected, became apparent that he would become the 16th, 16th or 17th president. He started to change. So, uh, you know, uh, don't expect too much, you know, at least uh, the acknowledgement, I think, is more than enough. Uh, plus, of course, he also sent a signal uh, during the anniversary of the Air Force that he would continue the force modernization, that he would fund the third horizon of the modernization program. The modernization of the AP, which, of course, began during the administration of Pres the late President Benigno Aquino, was a signal to China that, you know, we would protect what we have to, you know, what we claim. So this is already a signal, a subtle signal, that at least building up the specifically the territorial defense capability of the armed forces of the Philippines, I think is also a clear signal. And the fact that he did not make any announcement uh, that he would distance the Philippines from the United States. In fact, before uh, last October and November, we see efforts to strengthen our alliance with the United States. Uh, that's a, a clear signal that uh, I have a term for this. Uh, it's kind of double-edged game, which I called limited hard balancing. But uh, this will be a topic for another forum. Okay. Well, well, for me, um, uh, in his uh, humble way, of course, he did uh, uh, something for the Philippines. Uh, meaning, uh, given that, of course, right now he's trying to um, uh, to repair uh, the the damage that has been done uh, in the previous administration in terms of its uh, with our alliance and relations with the United States. But uh, I think uh, the most important would be uh, the consistency of uh, his foreign policy. In the previous administration, we saw flip-flopping foreign policy. I hope this time around we will be consistent on what we want to be from our national interests, national objectives, and national policy. So um, even if uh, China will behave differently, at least we are consistent with our foreign policy. So that's uh, what I want to expect from him. So we, uh, as a follow-up, we have a question here from one of our guests here in the event venue. So the Philippines has uh, had filed more than 200 diplomatic protests to China about its activities and behavior in the West Philippine Sea. What are the results of those protests? Any positive outcomes? And what could be done to be more assertive? Although I think you did answer that a little, Nishan. Well, at least we're indicating that we're not accepting what China is doing. It's not basically a matter of accepting what's fait accompli. Uh, what we can do would be long term. That is, of course, we have to back our diplomatic protests with the military muscle. And no less than the former National Security Advisor, uh, uh, I uh, forgot his name, uh, the National Security Advisor in the previous administration uh, announced that, you know, no, sir. Esperon, sorry, Esperon, said that, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the Duterte administration, basically, uh, again, made another realization. We really have to develop our military capability to back those, uh, you know, those diplomatic protests. As the old cliche goes, the military capability is the iron fist that is covered by the velvet glove of diplomacy. You know, diplomatic protests are part of meaningful noises that we are creating right now. It will, it will not pay off in this generation, but in the future it will pay off. The world will be like that. What you do right now in the future, it will, it, you, will get, you will reap what you, 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 you've done so far. It's not in our generation, but uh, once China will realize the, some of their mistakes and in the future Filipinos will assert it uh, given that we created a lot of noises by uh, securing our, um, our um, um, of course our interest then uh, the next generation will play a major role in uh, telling our narratives. Okay, 
Thank you very much, sir. Unfortunately, we only have uh, time for one more question, and this is addressed to all of our speakers. So we can start with uh, Dr. Holmes and Colonel Powell, who are with us via Zoom. Um, what do you think are the other, uh, moving forward or looking forward since we are at the start of a new year, what other security challenges do you think will evolve in 2023 that will affect the Philippines and the Indo-Pacific? Uh, Colonel Powell? All right, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Holmes? And then, for example, the visual security issue, you still have the continuing containers that we're faced with. You have countries that have already put in place uh, additional restrictions. China has warned other countries not to set those restrictions also. And the Philippines would have to think about it. The president is now in China. I don't know what the conversation is. But those are the things that basically uh, reflect the extent by which the Philippines is quite concerned about its own, in the, in the broader sense, the safety and security of everyone in the country. All right, thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. DeCastro? Uh, Dr. Chester. Uh, well, um, for me, uh, last night I got interviewed by CGTN in Beijing, and um, the four um, uh, areas of cooperation that uh, China and the Philippines uh, they, say, uh, they said that uh, will uh, prevail would be on uh, the agriculture, energy, infrastructure, and uh, people and cultural exchanges. We'll see if uh, this will be realized in the next uh, five years. And of course, the digital economy that um, they wanted to explore also. So those are some of the uh, non-traditional and traditional issues that I think uh, will be pursued in the next uh, years to come. Okay. Uh in the light of what happened in Ukraine, where you have, of course, the return of conventional war in Europe, my take is the South China Sea issue might take a side role. The main concern will be the Taiwan Straits. China has already indicated that it intends to resolve the issue once and for all. Uh, the President Joe Biden has basically moved away from the earlier concept of strategic ambiguity, more clear that the United States would be involved, and recently, of course, the, uh, the Defense Act of 2023 basically provides military assistance to Taiwan, amounting to about, uh, aside from the annual sale of about 13 billion, you have 2 billion in military assistance being given to Taiwan, and Taiwan recently uh, increased its your know, months of uh, compulsory military service from four months to one year, and I've attended two conferences in Taiwan, and the topic has always been the possibility of a major conflict in you know, the Taiwan Strait. And just in case that things happen, it would make look, you know, the war in between Russia and Ukraine look like a minor skirmish. Uh, plus, of course, the fact that we are sitting right next to what I call a brewing volcano, and it will test, test our alliance with the United States. Okay, so I think this is the, you know, the traditional geostrategic issue that we have to focus on. Very, very interesting and quite a scary <laughs> forecast, sir. All right. Yes. All right. And that concludes our first event for the year. Again, thank you very much, Dr. De Castro, Dr. Cabalza, and also Colonel Powell, and Dr. Holmes, and also Professor Dindo Manhit. Again, thank you very much, sir, and to all our guests here in our event venue, and also to everyone who's watching us via Zoom and Facebook live stream. 
and the hope you can join us again in our next uh, town hall discussion. This is again Joyce Ilas. Thank you, and have a good rest of the day. Didn't it used to be? Recording stopped.